Welcome to Psychotherapy CPD. This is our test session of our masterclass on how to set up your own therapy practice. I'm Alan Archibald and this is... I am Cecilia Carlotti. Welcome everyone. Um, so a little bit about ourselves before we start. Uh, I am a psychodynamic psychotherapist. Uh, I've got a background in mental health nursing. Uh, I've had my own practice now for the last three years and prior to that worked in the NHS. Um, I'm also a psychodynamic psychotherapist with a background in uh, psychology, clinical psychology. Um, I have been working in private practice for the past five years. Alan and I trained together at the Tavisto Clinic and uh, lately we decided to uh, combine our uh, knowledges uh, to set up this project. Uh, psychotherapy CPD is not just the masterclass that we're going to give you a taster of today, which will help you from start up to maintaining your practice, but it'll also have add-ons uh, around things like uh, alcohol addiction, how to refer into the NHS, um, how to create a peer support group uh, for your service and for your ongoing CPD type stuff. Um, and so keep an eye out for, for these sessions coming up soon as well. But today, I'll be the masterclass in uh, setting up your own practice. So yes, this uh, masterclass is uh, called Growing Your uh, Dream Practice. And it's a masterclass designed to everyone who is currently thinking of um, opening uh, uh, their personal private practice. Uh, just to say, although uh, our background is in psychodynamic psychotherapy, um, this is not a masterclass designed exclusively for psychodynamic psychotherapists. It is in fact uh, um, uh, a workshop uh, uh, designed for uh, everyone who is in the mental health field, so even uh, uh, not just therapists, not just psychotherapists, but everyone in the mental health field who is um, indeed uh, thinking of opening a private practice. Mm -hmm. is, uh, uh, made of, uh, is a seven weeks uh, long course. Uh, the first six weeks uh, we go through um, uh, practical sessions so uh, it's a w workshop that is designed uh, week by week to go through different elements that we believe are important to know uh, in order to open your private practice. Uh, the seventh week is uh, a reflective session where uh, we come together as a group. We discuss uh, the outcomes, we discuss what uh, uh, has come up uh, over the weeks, we discuss uh, ideas and suggestions and uh, um, plans for um, for everyone to, before uh, they uh, they they are going to uh, begin with their private practices. Mm. I mean, one of the things that we really want to do was to take somebody on that journey from that first thought about what their private practice might look like, right the way through the planning process, uh, which we'll do in the six sessions, uh, looking at. Uh, what your dream is before you start, uh, how can you build on that, what sort of practicalities do you need to take into account and we go through that journey together with some reflective space as well, uh, some practical hints and tips um, and right the way through to, to having your practice and maintaining it um, and one of the unique things uh, about our um, masterclass is that it contains uh, mentor sessions as well alongside uh, the practical six sessions uh, plus the reflective. Yes, it's uh, 12 mentorship uh, classes, 12 mentorship uh, sessions, apologies, and uh, uh, you can arrange them uh, at your convenience. Uh, we can decide together when it is a suitable time for you to attend this session throughout a year. And uh, we thought that this is an important part of the course because it, is an, it, it will allow you to have a space to reflect uh, over the time you are uh, about or you are in, in due course uh, of uh, opening your private practice. Mm. So these mentor sessions are available uh, independently as well and it will give you a sort of one-on-one -on -one, uh, with somebody with their own therapy practice 
to be able to think with them, uh, your ideas, and on a one-to-one -one basis, be able to expand on that and to develop your practice with as least amount of cost uh, and problems as we could possibly help you with, really. I mean, there will be things that will crop up that will be challenging, but at least you'll have a mentor to go back to to, to think through what these issues are on a one-to-one -one basis and be able to work through it with them. So I think uh, without uh, an indulge, we can move on and, uh, and present yeah. uh, a little bit. I'll give you a taster of what our uh, course uh, will look like. Yeah, so what we're going to do is to go through uh, one slide of each of the six weeks of sessions. Um, just one slide per uh, week. Um, and uh, we can talk through some of the things that we'll discuss uh, in that particular week of the course. And if you have any sort of uh, questions or queries, then you can always email us at psychotherapy uh, CPD. Uh, the email address is on our website, which is available um, through uh, the, the channel. You can also uh, write your questions in the channel's uh, chat and uh, we will check it periodically and we will make sure that we will find a way to address them, either uh, responding to them uh, in the website, in our uh, frequently asked questions uh, section or uh, if you uh, if you provide an account we can address that uh, in the uh, in the channel mm, I mean if you email us we can e email you directly mm -hmm. uh, and answer any questions or, or queries that you might have Absolutely. Um, one of the other things that we're adding uh, to this which we thought was really important is that if you feel that the uh, course is too much to pay all in one go, um, then please do let us know. Please email us. Uh, and we can look to, to help you with those costs and to pay them over a period of time rather than in one uh, bulk uh, instalment. But that's obviously on an individual basis. And if you contact us via email, we can uh, speak that and talk about that with you. So the sense of this is that we are trying to provide um, a service that will help you to go through your, the main difficulties uh, of opening a private practice. We are aware that at the beginning of a journey like uh, or setting up your own private practice, uh, there might be some financial concern. So we are willing to uh, support you and uh, if uh, you think that uh, the uh, amount of the course is too much for you to sustain at, um, all together, uh, we can discuss that and try to uh, tailor a, a plan that can work for you. Mm. So without further ado, uh, let's start our uh, taster. So as Cecilia was saying, uh, it's a masterclass in growing your dream practice. Just to mention and remind you that uh, this will be run over Zoom. So um, if you're mm. not familiar with Zoom, maybe uh, you might want to download your uh, on your laptop or on your device uh, in order to familiarize with that a little bit just before starting the course. Mm. I mean, it's pretty straightforward Zoom and it has sort of chat functions and things like that. So And it's uh, very confidential and secure. Um, device that we use uh, for patient sessions as well um, and lots of other organizations so uh, the first week we'll be looking at the dream and preparing for your private practice and the main aim of uh, this first session uh, is to help you start to think about what your ideas are uh, about how you want your practice to, to look like. What does it look like at the very start? What are the ideals that you have for your practice? So one of the things that we'll look at uh, in this uh, week's uh, session is what to think about before you begin. So we'll be focusing on things that perhaps um, we've reflected on as practitioners set up our own business, but equally... Uh, things that you might not initially think about. Things like days and times that you want to work and how that will impact on creating your private practice. Um, things like bank holidays uh, or on a Monday and Friday uh, in the UK, uh, generally around the summertime. Uh, if you want to work bank holidays, that's absolutely fine. But then 
at the beginning it'll be better to think about what the implications of that uh, if you're in a type of therapy like psychodynamic or psychoanalytic therapy then that would need to be taken into account because um, there may be uh, resentment build up inside you for having to work every bank holiday or there might be the patient that misses out on several sessions before the summer break uh, because of the bank holiday so the, these are things that um, obviously you know don't preclude you from working Monday to Friday but certainly should be thought about and kept in mind I mean even therapies that aren't uh, sort of psychodynamic or psychoanalytic uh, it's worth thinking about that if you're only working a Monday and Friday what impact is that going to have with the bank holidays as far as finance is concerned uh, are you going to work weekends some practitioners do and uh, that's absolutely fine it depends what fits in with your lifestyle uh, but it's worth thinking about uh, because in the longer term as well if you're working weekends uh, you need to plan at the beginning is that something that you're gonna uh, do in the longer term or is it a short term uh, are these weekend sessions going to be offered on a sort of more ad hoc basis or are they going to be regular um, looking at holidays are you going to take a, a yearly sort of basis holiday so are you going to take a summer Easter Christmas break uh, or is it going to be a bit more fluid are you going to allow yourself uh, a little bit more flexibility uh, and be able to give the patients uh, say a six weeks notice uh, for holidays that you have and not be fixed for the, the three term time which is a sort of more traditional uh, approach I guess where are you going to be located? Are you going to be lo located in one place? Uh, or are you going to be alone in, or in team? Uh, what's the travel time between these locations? Uh, so we'll be looking at um, when you first start out, are you going to be located in one place? I know from my, my own personal experience, I, I worked in two or three different locations when I first started. And one of the important things that I guess came, that came out of that was the travel time between locations. Uh, one, because of timings, um, it shortened the amount of time that I could give to client care. Um, but also as well, what did that time in between the sessions in the travel time, what did it give to me? Did it give me a reflective space? Uh, did it give me more stress before going to the next location to see somebody? All these things we need to think about at the beginning, about what it means to you really as a practitioner. Um, are you going to have a home-based um, psychotherapy service or therapy service? And if so, do you need to look at things like privacy and safety? So things like risk assessment, what sort of patient group are you going to take? Um, if patients come into your home and you're um, not in a higher risk, how are you going to manage that? Um, also with privacy both for the patient and for yourself if you're working from home and you've got other family members coming and going then you need to think about the privacy for the patient is it invading their privacy to have your husband or wife uh, wander uh, past as they're coming in uh, which is entirely possible not something that can't be worked around or thought about in the sessions but certainly something that should be thought about uh, before setting up and, and, and start to have it in your mind really um, we can think about things like specialisms what would you like to specialise in um, is it something that you're going to have a sort of niche uh, there's a lot of uh, information on the internet about setting up your niche in your practice when you start out standing out from the crowd and that's fine we can think about that together about that's if that's something that you want to do in your clinic but there's also the other side if you have a niche speciality, then it limits you to that uh, speciality. It does um, give you a particular client group, but it may um, cause you to lose other, other sort of specialities that you might have some interest in. Um, looking at male and females uh, mix and LGBTQ uh, plus, um, what sort of mix of patient group would you like? And, and that continues really. So that first session, uh, just looking at what your ideas are about your practice and get people start to think, get you start to think uh, about what your idea for your practice is and start to take shape. So the next week, uh, we look at specifics of work time. So we take that initial dream that we've thought about in the first session and we start to firm up um, some of the ideas that you've had. So this uh, slide is from that session. 
uh, week two and let's look at firming up the image and looking at where it fits. So now we've got an idea about your practice. Where does your practice fit? Looking at the local area, um, what other therapy services are, is, uh, are available there? Is there a, a massive glut of, of your type of therapy, your specialism in your area? Um, or is there a bit of a scarcity, really, of your therapy in your area? Uh, is it directed at the centre of a city uh, or a town or a village? Is it suburban? Um, so all these sorts of uh, locations uh, may or may not make a difference to the client group that comes to you, but um, certainly need thought about, really. I mean, if you're working in the inner city, in London, for instance, you may find a more acute patient group. You may find a particular client group uh, that has problems with drugs and alcohol, uh, you might find more sort of high stress individuals uh, uh, working in the city. If you're working in a village, you might find more sort of depression. You might find more suicidality if it's around sort of farming communities. Um, these are the things to, to think about, really. Uh, what specialities are you providing uh, or advertising? And we'll look at that and think, right, OK, so you are, we, you know, you've decided in your mind, yeah, I'm going to advertise uh, I'm going to uh, sell the speciality that I've got, the niche that I've got. So it's worth thinking about how you uh, are going to provide that and how you're going to advertise that. What age group are you looking to accommodate or prefer to accommodate? So in the first session, the first week, we might start to think about what sort of age group you want to work with, which ones you qualify to work with for a start. Uh, but then how do you accommodate them and how do you advertise for that uh, in your practice itself? Is it to do with the type of social media? Uh, if you advertise them for a younger uh, client group, then do you access things like TikTok? That's a possibility. It's not the most professional of um, social media to advertise on, but it is a growing sort of trend in the under 30s to use TikTok. So it might be somewhere to, to advertise. Uh, what model of therapy are you focusing on? Are you going to be sort of more formal in the way that you uh, give your therapy or you're more casual in your approach? And that's not just around things like whether you take a psychodynamic psychoanalytic approach or whether you take uh, CBT or EMDR. Um, it is uh, is to do with that, but it's also to do with your style and it's important to think about what that is when you start your own practice. I mean, this is your practice. Um, it's your fresh start as uh, as a practitioner. Um, so it'll be thinking about where, uh, what sort of style you want to have and you want to build on within your practice. What will be your boundaries? I mean, that's a really important one. Um, you know, are you going to accept texts from patients, uh, emails? Uh, is it going to be phone contact? How are you going to respond to patients? Are you going to respond at that time? When they when they email you, or you're going to wait and, and respond when it's back in working hours, and these are things to take into account prior to starting. Obviously, you know the different patients. You need to think about on an individual basis basis what's best for them, what fits in the model of therapy. But thinking beforehand about what your boundaries are can be a really important way uh, of uh, taking care of not just of your patients but also of yourself as well. And I think that's equally important. Um, to take care of yourself, to be able to look after your patients. Uh, does what you have fit into the location you want to provide? So looking at uh, the speciality you've got, the client group that you want to take in, um, does that fit into um, the location that you want to provide it? So for instance, if your speciality was more around... It could be around alcohol use. Um, then, is it the right location to 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 advertise that? Is there a need for it in that location? Um, is what you're providing uh, something that people want, need, and and sure uh, a need for? Um, what is the demand of your service now? So, I mean, it's important to think about that. You can do something as simple as sort of Google for your, your sort of, uh, what sort of service you're going to provide. You can Google for that in your area or the area you're going to work and see what comes back. What, what's the competition like? Um, and think about how you might fit into that, uh, how you might get around it and uh, provide something slightly different to the competition. 
Um, so the next week, uh, so this is week three, is jobs to do before launch. So now you've got a, a really firm view about uh, how your practice is going to look. Uh, you've looked at uh, which location, how you're going to advertise. Um, you've got the idea in your mind. Your practice is already starting to, to develop in your mind and is already sort of conceived, really. Uh, and then we look at jobs to do before launch. One of the things that we look at in this week is finding a home uh, for your practice. So looking at the location, and uh, not just uh, the location, but terms and conditions what's normally offered and how to manage that. So things like, um, you know, when you go to, to hire a therapy room, um, what sort of conditions are going to be attached? Is it going to be that uh, if you're hiring a room just for the hours that you see a patient, there's potentially gaps in between. How much of a gap? Do you get 10 minutes between each patient? Uh, if you see a patient and then have to leave the room because it's booked by somebody else, what is the buffer time-wise? If it's a very short buffer, are you going to have time and space around that to be able to write notes, to, to collect your thoughts? Um, and also to think about things like charities and alternative locations. One, you know, could charities and alternative locations could provide something that's a little bit cheaper, a little bit more financially viable for you. But equally, then it might be in a location that's slightly off the, the normal beaten track. What does it portray of your uh, business if it's in a sort of charity-based uh, organisation? Does it say to the patient that you, you are a charity? Uh, which is fine, but if you're not, then it's a bit of a discrepancy. Uh, looking at locations and exp uh, deposits and expectations. So does uh, the room that you're going to, to hire require a deposit and have you got the financial backing to be able to do that? Are you going to have the patients coming through to, to pay for this room long enough for you to fill? Um, or is it that you're able to access something that's uh, on an ad hoc basis? Now, you can get ad hoc rooms. These tend to be uh, a little bit more uh, financially onerous. So, for instance, if you book a room regularly, it might be £10 an hour. Um, if you book it on an ad hoc basis, it might be £14 an hour. Not much of a difference on the face of it, but then when you add costs, it does, uh, it does add up. Looking at where you're located as well as expanding as you grow. Is there room uh, where you're located to expand and stay in the same premises? Or is it that when you do expand, you're going to have to move to a different location? That's important to keep that in mind um, because you're going to have to move the patients that have came to you in the same location to expand and grow if there's not enough room to grow in the place that you've picked. Um, is the place that you're going to rent comfortable and homely for you? I mean, you're going to be there a lot of the time. This is going to be your workplace. Um, are you able to sit in that space comfortably to be able to provide something for the clients that, that feels like it belongs to you, that, that you can uh, feel comfortable working there, that you don't give off an air of this is uncomfortable, I don't want to be here, I'd rather be somewhere else? How do you make it home for yourself? Uh, and also looking at one location or more than one location. What are the positives? What are the negatives? Um, you know, How can you... Um, fit around that I mean if you have to work in different locations if you prefer to work in different locations that's fine but what are the implications how do you prepare for them uh, and how do you plan for them and looking at stability for you and the patient so having a stable base isn't just important for you um, uh, you know not just important for the patient but it's also important for you as well uh, making sure that the patient feels that they have a stable base and also from you, making sure you feel you've got a stable base and you're not just flitting from one location to another to another, not really feeling like you have a home. Um, and so we, we look at, um, that's one of the, the, the slides from that week. So by the end of this week, we hope that you've got um, an idea of what you're going to build and you've got more of a sort of clear idea about what that looks like uh, from a re re reality perspective and then you start to think about right what do I need to have in place before uh, before actually launch and start this business and then uh, week four I'll pass on to Cecilia now. 
Thank you, Alan. Uh, yes, week four is called launching and what to expect. And uh, we will look at some aspects, some of those uh, we might have already um, looked at them uh, in the previous weeks, but um, uh, we will uh, bring them up again in a different uh, context. So in this week, we are going to uh, look at uh, several uh, issues, several aspects that we think is important to keep in mind just before you're about to start. So one of the aspects that uh, we thought it was important to keep in mind is uh, the due date. What do we mean by due date? So the due date is the date you have decided, uh, uh, the date you have uh, set up to launch your private practice. So the date when your private practice uh, will effectively start. Um, so have you set up a start date yet? Have you decided a date um, uh, to start yet? We, we think that setting up a starting date makes the process more real uh, because uh, ultimately it's easier to work towards the deadline. Um, this also means that uh, you can start divulging uh, what, uh, when you will become available and you can start promoting yourself, you can start letting people know that you're now uh, taking uh, referrals. Also, um, if you are, um, if you are uh, registering with uh, um, HMRC as a self-employed, a sole trader, your starting date will also coincide with the legal start of your business, so it will become effectively uh, your practice's birthday. Um, once you have decided your, uh, your starting date, you can update your website, uh, you can uh, write some adverts, update your social media, update your blogs uh, with your availability. So uh, whatever media you have decided to use for your, to promote yourself, if any, uh, as this is not, of course, compulsory. But if you decide to promote yourself on the web, um, make sure that you keep everything up to date with uh, your um, starting date and your availability. Perhaps you may also uh, want to uh, consider writing a brief post where you advertise yourself, where you advertise the opening of your practice, and maybe, maybe a video, short video, or maybe a written post that you can um, put on your website or on your social media. Uh, after this, you, can, uh, you may want to inform your colleagues, perhaps your peer group, your supervisor, uh, organization you're already working, uh, or GP practices around you, uh, your professional body, anyone, pretty much, that uh, you are now taking referrals. So I think it's important to uh, recall that uh, uh, there are we would we talk we will talk about this elsewhere uh, in more of that um, there are several sources of, uh, of uh, referrals but uh, a very important bunch of referrals will come from professionals who know you and know your work and they trust you um, so uh, make sure that you you they, everyone who know you and know your work um, is aware that uh, your practice is about to open one is about to open and you're now happy to take uh, referrals. Um, you may want to communicate this in different ways. You know, some people might like to write a, a detailed email and send it to everyone. Some others might want to record to group chats or sending individual text messages or making individual phone calls. Or, you know, you might prefer to keep it more casual and just letting people know when you're casually bumped into them. Um, whatever works, as long as uh, you are kept in mind, really. Uh, you may even want to deci decide to just have in a physical um, uh, business card and handling in to people when you bump into them. Um, it's up to you and, and it's uh, essentially what works for you. And finally, um, um, yeah, keep an eye on the starting date. Uh, uh, is it too close to a holiday, a bank holiday, a break? Uh, check the calendar. Um, as exciting as uh, it can be to set up a starting date, as impatient you might be to start as soon as possible, perhaps for some practitioners, uh, starting before a break might not be the best. Perhaps uh, it might feel a bit disruptive. Uh, it might feel disruptive for the patient. 
um, uh, particularly if you're planning a long-term treatment, um, uh, maybe starting before a break might, sound, might feel a little bit uh, destabilizing. So um, a lot of elements to, to keep in mind. So um, we will uh, move to uh, week five, which is called uh, uh, They Will Come and You Will Find Them. And uh, obviously we are talking about patients. We are talking about different ways to, um, uh, to get referrals. We will talk about uh, perhaps how would you feel uh, about uh, the, the moment before taking patients. We will talk about uh, expectations as well. Um, in this particular slide, we will focus on the moment uh, just after you have started to receive referrals. So the moment uh, when you are effectively starting to work. First of all, uh, congratulations, you got it. You got your first patient or your first patients and uh, you are now ready to start. But how are you going to handle the arrival of referrals? Uh, Will you be willing to receive patients one by one, or will you uh, would you prefer to get all together all at once? Obviously, there is no rule. Uh, in an ideal world, you might perhaps fantasize of meeting one patient after the hour after the other and receiving a balanced number of referrals. Uh, or, as we said, um, some other practitioners might just prefer to just having all the they might prefer to have uh, to see uh, everyone at once um, well it's important to remember that uh, there is no rule and that uh, sometimes referral come in waves sometimes in drops and in order to avoid disappointment you might be uh, uh, want to be prepared to manage your ex ex expectations and also assessing your resources. So what are you prepared to do? What, uh, how many patients are you prepared to receive? Uh, you might have to say no from time to time if you feel that the amount of referrals you're receiving is too, is too much for you to handle. So uh, perhaps it's worthy to um, take a moment to reflect on how many new patients are you happy to see at the same time. So as we said before, Practitioners might be prepared to handle a different amount of patients at time. Uh, make sure you are aware of your limits and uh, what is best for your work, so you can make sensible decisions on how many new referrals to, you want to accept. Uh, keep in mind that an exhaustive practitioner might not be uh, the, the best uh, advertising. Um, uh, yeah, and... Uh, Try to avoid burning out, essentially, and uh, make sure that uh, you are there to, uh, for the patient uh, with all your energy and your capacity. So quality versus quantity, what is your balance? Uh, uh, again, everyone has a different way uh, of working. Each professional is dif uh, works differently. Um, you know, if you're paying a room per hour, you might feel the pressure to fill up the hours uh, you pay for. And seeing if you pay for five hours, you may feel the pressure of uh, getting five patients. Uh, however, it is important to reflect on what is sensible to do, um, whether you, you will be able to offer a good presence to everyone, uh, to all of them. I mean, is five patients in a row too much for you? Um, are you able to offer the same, um, the, the same, the same uh, quality of uh, performance uh, yeah, to patient one and patient five? So um, if you are offering different type of treatments, you may want to take into account how much time uh, and uh, uh, professional uh, effort and personal effort uh, each patient will take. So, uh, you know, for instance, it might feel okay to take a single consultation as an extra, but if you're working uh, with uh, uh, long-term treatments, um, you know, uh, how much uh, it will cost you in terms of also extra work. So how much time uh, do you want to dedicate to each patient overall? Um, I mean, prepare yourself beforehand uh, keep in mind that um, you need all, 
besides the time spent with the patients, you need extra time for notes, correspondence, reading. Uh, remember that if you pack your uh, hours uh, with session, you might have no time for uh, paperwork, reflection. This is another very important time uh, part of the work. So uh, make sure that uh, you will allow enough time outside the clinical time, outside the time with the patient uh, to dedicate to that in order not to panic before a deadline, for instance. So the last, uh, last week of the, or at least not the last week of the course, but the last practical uh, week uh, is called maintenance and keeping it going. And uh, it is about uh, considering several uh, aspects that uh, um, will help you to uh, keep going through your practice without uh, panicking, without uh, feeling overwhelmed. It will, it will include aspects such as safeguarding, risk assessment, um, writing uh, notes, um, uh, tax returns as well. Um, today, uh, the ex um, as an example of, uh, of this week, I have chosen to present you uh, um, what is about the GDPR regulation, which is a very important part of, of our job. Uh, this slide is called You Can Trust Me. So it's about uh, uh, guaranteeing patients that uh, we, can, uh, we can protect uh, confidentiality about uh, their uh, personal data. This is not just about us uh, guaranteeing that, but uh, is regulated by law. Uh, so GDPR stands for General Data Protection Legislation. Uh, it's an European uh, Union law that came into effect on the 25th of May 2018. So GDPR governs the way in which we can use, process and store personal data. By personal data, we mean information about an identifiable living person. It applies to all the organizations within the EU and therefore it applies to pri uh, private practitioners as well. So GDPR is the legislative force established to protect the fundamental rights of data subjects whose personal information are, and sensitive data is stored in organizations. Data subjects and patients as well, in our case, uh, will now have the right to demand uh, subject uh, to demand access to their personal information and the right to demand an organization and us as practitioners destroys the personal information so keep it in mind uh, while you're writing your notes for instance are you prepared to uh, show your data uh, your detail what you have written about the patient to the patient so as we said, this regulation will, aspect, uh, will affect uh, most sectors within business, from marketing to health services and indeed um, psychotherapy and uh, mental health services as well. Therefore, to avoid the fines that are administered by the uh, Information Commissioner's Office or ICO, it is essential to become GDPR compliant. So the ICO, which I just mentioned, is the Information Commissioner's Office uh, and it's a UK independent body set up to uh, uphold information rights. So uh, I suggest that uh, you uh, have a look at the ICO website, which is ico.org.uk to be properly informed about the regulation. But here I have uh, mm, summarized a few key points that are essential to be kept in mind and are key points indeed about the GDPR. So, um, first of all, all the patient's records should be proper, appropriate and confidential. So, um, how do you record your notes? How do you record um, uh, personal information about your patient? Keep it in mind that uh, they have the right to access it. So, it's important that this is always, uh, uh, is, uh, what you write, what you record is always appropriate and is always uh, okay in order to be shown to um, potentially to a patient. So uh, any record should be kept only for the duration of the treatment and destroyed once the treatment is ended. So once your, your, your um, relationship with your patient is over, 
um, your um, papers should be destroyed. Patients have the right to be informed about how you handle your, their records and they can have access to it if they want to, as we said. So again, are you prepared to share your records with your uh, patients if they ask to? Uh, there will be a little discussion about that in due course. Personal data and records should be kept in a secure place uh, where no one apart from the therapist uh, uh, has access, which means locked cabins for physical papers and password uh, protection for digital papers. Um, we will have a little discussion as well uh, whether it is appropriate to write reports for solicitors, authorities, how to be prepared. But finally, um, always remember when in doubt, password protect, particularly for digital papers, it's uh, um, better safe than sorry. So if you password protect all your papers uh, uh, um, that you have on your uh, on your devices that are about your patients, even mm, the ones that you think might be safe to show, um, there will be uh, no misunderstanding for sure. So um, that brings us to the end of the uh, taste the sessions. I guess one of the important things for us to, to mention is that's just a very, very small uh, selection of information that we talk about with you and, and discuss with you. Uh, about starting your own practice. Uh, one of the biggest things that we found and a lot of people we've spoken to is that when you become a private therapist uh, and start your own business, uh, you're not just a therapist anymore, but you are also got your own business to run. And that's not something that, that everybody has training in or a background in, how to run a business and how to be a therapist. And these two uh, parts uh, need to work together a lot of the time uh, when you uh, have your own practice. You need to keep in mind, one, the business side and make sure that you're able to run the business that you want. And part of that is the resources you need to run that business. And two, also keep in mind uh, that you're a therapist and what you can provide for the patient and that the business doesn't interfere with the patient and the patient um, you know, the, that you have enough patients to be able to run a business that's financially stable and, and survivable for yourself as well, um, and that pays the bills, basically. Absolutely. Um, it's uh, a very difficult one. Absolutely. And uh, I also wanted to stress that uh, during the course there will be plenty of space for discussions. Uh, mm. We believe that also, uh, you know, sharing ideas and sharing thoughts and sharing... Uh, feelings as well uh, towards uh, uh, the the new uh, adventure. Uh, it's an important part of the of this course. Mm. I mean, it's a, we want it to be a space that is able to sort of contain, develop, and grow uh, your ideas of what your practice is going to be like, and to be able to take it from just an idea to having it as a thriving thriving business that not only benefits you but benefits your patients as well. Uh, because the, the least stressful it could possibly be, uh, the better to set up your own sort of therapy practice and, and that will benefit the patients as well as yourself. Absolutely. Well, we are at the end uh, for today. Uh, I'd like to thank you for, for watching this video. Uh, you can go to psychotherapy-cpd.co.uk. Uh, uh, the link should be in uh, the channel here. Yes, there will be. There are some dates set up for our next courses. Uh, so the next one uh, will start on the on Thursday, the nineteenth of October. Again, running for seven weeks, and uh, uh, we already have some dates set up for uh, twenty twenty four. I think uh, it, it will, next one will be for twenty twenty four will be uh, on mm. February. It is. I mean, I've got uh, a little slide here of. These are the dates for uh, the current course. It's going to run very shortly, so please go through and, and book yourself down for that. Uh, and then and that runs all the way to the 7th of December as the last um, course date. Now, with the mentoring sessions, um, I think Cecilia said 12, but I think it's actually six mentoring sessions spread over uh, the course of uh, the sessions that we do. But... These can be negotiated with the uh, mentor and yourself. So you can take these whenever yourself and the mentor has space and time. It doesn't need to be taken at a particular time that's dictated to you. It can be a negotiation between you and the, the mentor themselves. So that's important to keep in mind. 
You can also book these sessions um, right the way through up to the first 12 months. So once you've booked onto the course, once that first course date has, has started, uh, there'll be 12 months from then uh, to book in these six uh, mentor sessions uh, at a rate that you and the mentor are able to, to work to, really. I mean, if you want to run uh, three in the first month, absolutely fine. Uh, if you want to space it out one one a month for for six months, absolutely fine. If you want once every two months, absolutely fine. I mean, it's between you and the the mentor. Really. Absolutely. So the the next lot of course dates after the the ones that are coming very shortly is in February. So I've got the dates there on the screen, uh, and that shows you the the the, the yep. names at least of the the sessions that we're going to do. So yeah, the big the first session will be on the first of February. And uh, uh, the last one will be on the 20, uh, 21st of March. Mm. So thank you again for joining us. Um, we hope that we see you soon on the course. Yes, we will look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks again. Bye now.